You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to The Open Door, a show based on the words in Revelation, I have left an open door before you, which no one can close. This is WCAT Radio's longest-running show, which opened the door to the radio station in October 2016. It's currently offered by Jim Hanink, Mario Ramos Reyes and Friends, and remains open to the love of God in its call to build a culture of life and a just social order through the panel's discussion of the Catholic social teaching principles of solidarity, subsidiarity, and economic democracy. The Open Door also explores nonviolence, distributism, and communitarianism. So join us at The Open Door, where you too can be part of the conversation. Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hanning here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos-Reyes and Christopher Zender. This week, we will reflect on the place of the rosary in Catholic life. Our special guest is the poet Annabelle Mosley, the author of Sacred Braille, the Rosary as Masterpiece. Our good friend Skylar Kovic will once again join us. Let's, as always, begin in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit. You have taught the hearts of your faithful. In the same spirit, help us to relish what is right, and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to begin, uh, Annabelle Mosley, with uh, a question that I'm sure uh, a lot of people will have in mind. How did you start to write this book? What was your inspiration? Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here with you all. Um, I I was led to write this book sort of through a twofold path, through my work both as a poet and my work as a professor. So as a poet, which I've been all my life, I've written on varied subjects, you know, from nature to relationships, finally to poems inspired by scripture and the saints. And I began to find that the poems on scripture and the saints were what was inspiring me the most. I published a double volume of poetry. It was called A Ship to Hold the World and the Marionette's Ascent. And it was all about characters from scripture. And I decided my next project, my next collection of poems, would be about the rosary. I made a conscious decision to spend time with the mysteries, dwelling on them in prayer. And I never attempted to even begin writing the poem until I felt moved from a lot of prayer in the rosary to what I felt was a new insight about a depth or um, some new truth about the mystery I'd never noticed before, something beautiful. And it was usually when I'd cried my heart out a bit through God's grace, through many weeks of praying that mystery, and then and only then I'd write the poem. Now, meanwhile, as a professor, I teach graduate students for a master's in theology program. And over the years, I noticed, and I have really great students. I mean, I have faith-filled, God-loving students. But over the years, I kept hearing these good people expressing frustration that they wished they prayed the rosary more. I had some students who prayed it daily, but a lot of times they'd say to me, you know, I just don't pray it often enough or I don't pray it at all. And they were, they were, you know, humble and, and honest enough to admit the truth. They said they found it challenging, monotonous, that it took too much time. They'd say they fell asleep sometimes, or they found it, they'd be honest. They'd say they they found it kind of boring. And, and that challenged and inspired me to write a book breathing new life, God willing, into people's experience of praying the rosary. Um, because you know what? The students were always, without exception, upset 
by the fact that they didn't pray it more. And I, I found that really interesting because they'd say, I wished I liked it more. Uh, and then they'd kind of add, it's just not my devotion, right? Kind of like they were saying it wasn't their favorite flavor of ice cream or something. Uh, kind of writing it off. But then they'd add in, but you know, I sense it's very important. I wish I could get myself to pray it more. And they often had like a treasured memory of a grandparent who used to pray it. And they wished they could too. And it haunted them. So I made notes of their criticism. It was always the same. They'd say it was repetitive. And I wanted to write a book that would be equally for those who already pray the rosary and love it, but also for those who never have. And then I started making connections in my own life. I realized, well, I I was born on the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, but then I discovered I was also baptized at St. Louis de Montfort Church, and he's a saint known for his devotion to the rosary. So I kind of began to feel I was meant to do it. At the very least, I felt I would choose, you know, to make a gift of this book about the rosary to Our Lady in gratitude. So, and then the last thing I'll say is right around the time I'm thinking all of this, um, a a priest asked me to lead a three-day retreat for deacon's wives in my diocese. And he said, you can choose any subject you like. (laughs) So I chose the rosary and the rest is history. Now, you mentioned uh, complaints about uh, repetitiveness uh, is is saying the rosary a, a spiritual discipline? Well, yes, um, it is. You know, um, in my book, I, I do state that the rosary is an exercise. You know, at like all exercise, we, we start out and our muscles hurt. You know, but it feels much better the more it's repeated. Uh, but I also make clear that my favorite way of explaining that repetition of the rosary is that it's really like saying, I love you, which can never be said enough. In fact, I can share this story with you. It's, it's a painful one. It's a story from my own life. But I made the choice to include it in the book because I presented it once to my students, and I was told by them that it changed the way they saw the rosary forever. It said, they said, wow, Professor Mosley, I'll never think of the rosary as monotonous again since you told us this story. So I'll share it with you now. I don't talk about it easily, but... I did include it in the book for a profound reason. Um, When my father was dying, I asked to ride in the ambulance at his side. I was 11 years old at the time, and when I say I asked to ride with him, I really mean I insisted stubbornly. I knew somehow it was very important that I be there. My mother and I got in the ambulance, never leaving my dad's side, and each of us took one of his hands. My father was still holding on to consciousness, though he couldn't speak. And I I remember studying his hands so I could memorize the feel of them, the palm, the fingers. And in the last litany I spoke to him, I repeated the words, I love you, again and again, as the screaming ambulance sped its way to the hospital. You know, it, it was the only thing I wanted to say. And in that space, it was all that mattered. I remember kissing his hand, pressing it to my cheek, holding it in my own two little hands, And, you know, it never occurred to me that I was being repetitive or that one I love you was enough. I just wanted to fill a lifetime of I love yous into his being while I knew he could still hear me. And that's, I believe, the spirit with which one ought to approach the rosary, a chance to hold Mary's hands, the hands that this way we are also, you know, holding Christ's hands because just like there's 10 beads in a decade, there are 10 fingers on a hand. And I'll tell you, thinking of the rosary as repetitive, well, that just fades away if one thinks of each Hail Mary as an I love you while holding our mother's hand. That's extraordinary. Now, um, you've already given us so much. I'm going to ask uh, Mario Ramos-Reyes to uh, continue the discussion here. Well, it's very interesting what I'm hearing about the rosary, but uh, I have a question that I was asking more than once. I don't teach uh, students who are believers, rather the contrary. They are embedded in this uh, nihilistic culture. And sometimes it's very hard to explain anything that is related to the transcendent, much less to the Catholic tradition. So what would you say to one student who are part of this class who want to be faithful and pray 
and, and yet the environment is such that he is prevented for some variety of reason to to express himself or herself. Oh, that's a that's an excellent question. You know, I'll share with you that I I feel blessed um, that I I teach in two places. So one of the places I teach is the seminary, uh, Saint Joseph Seminary, and obviously I'm 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 getting really deeply faithful people there who are living their faith daily. But I also teach at a college that um, I get to teach in the religious studies department of that college. And I get a lot of undergrads, just like you described, Mario, um, who are searching and, and immersed in a culture that is not, as you say, so beautifully, you really express that so eloquently, right? That they're just facing these um, obstacles to their faith. I like to tell them, it's sort of like the story I just shared um, with you about my dad, um, for example, when they say, well, why should we go to mass every week? You know, isn't it the kind of thing where if I love God, I can just stay home? Um, this is of course pre pandemic, right? But even during the pandemic, they'd say, well, why, why bother watching the mass on television? You know, why can't we just love our God in our own way and just sort of enjoy nature and think thoughts to ourselves about God? And I would say to them, and this would work, you know, I'm just speaking from what I know. They'd say, wow, that changes my thoughts. I'd say, well, do you, if you love your parents, don't you want to visit them? Just keeping it really simple, you know, if you love your mother and your father, you want to show up at their house. It's not enough just to meet them on a nature walk. (laughs) You want to go to their house. And the rosary is a way of telling our mother and through her, our father, our heavenly father of our love. And my students do all across the board, even the ones that are the most far from religion, they all admit that when you're in love with someone Um, a beloved, a spouse, um, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, or, you know, that special relationship of our parents, that one I love you is never enough. So the repetition is important. Not to mention my students do relate to when I talk about the rosary, how it's calming, because we're in a very anxious culture these days, as we know, and the times we're living in are so anxiety ridden, that the prayer beads um, that Our Lady so wisely gives us, you know, psychologists have actually done studies that when you pray the rosary, you're notably calmer. And I'll tell them, you know, you can look across many cultures and you'll see some kind of prayer bead. And they have said, psychologists have studied that the very motion of holding beads in between your two fingers is actually really calming. So stories like that seem to enchant them and, and make them more likely to give it a shot. And I've heard good things. Uh, you're telling us some important stories, pedagogical stories. And uh, the rosary, in a sense, is a story. And Christopher Zender writes stories. So, Christopher, I wonder if you could pursue a bit with Annabelle, the narrative dimension, shall we say, of the rosary. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, my background actually is I, I'm a convert. I, was, I became Catholic 37 years ago. I was a Lutheran. So I always actually found the rosary rather difficult. And I still do. And I say it now daily because I'm a, I'm a lay Dominican and it's part of being a lay Dominican to see the rosary. So it's sort of ironic that that should happen. Um, but the, I think the difficulty, for me at least, is sometimes, especially when you're tired, the imagination aspect. It seems like that's what is very much emphasized in, in, the, in the, the story that's occurring within the, whole, with the, with the, with the mysteries of the rosary. Is that the only way of praying the rosary? What do you think? So, if I hear you right, you're you're saying that. Um, the stories within the mysteries that sometimes when you... Right, the stories, right? So you're imagining the things that are happening. Right, that's that's right. That's exactly right. Well, that's actually, uh, Christopher, that's one of the things that I I pray and hope that my book will achieve, is that it's really a prayer companion. Um, Bishop Henning, in the foreword to my book, suggests that people use the the book not to be read once, kind of like, okay, I read the book, but to sort of keep it and keep returning to it. Um, You know, maybe... As a prayer, as a prayer companion, because um, what I hope to do through the poems is, you know, to kind of do that work for the reader where, right, because we don't want to pray in a lukewarm way. We want to pray where we're fully, as, as much as we can, you know, we're human, but to fully be present to that mystery. 
which is, uh, you know, hearing you talk about your experience as a convert, it's scripturally based. It's scripturally based. The rosary is the stories of scripture. Every prayer of the rosary, um, almost every word of every prayer of the rosary comes directly from scripture. It's called Mary's Psalter. Um, it's a way that we can really, scripture comes more and more alive the more we pray the rosary because the mysteries of the rosary is an archive of Christ's life and passion um, and all that Mary and Jesus gave to us. But I, but the poems that in this book, the way that this book is a prayer companion is let's say you go to that first mystery, you read the poem, the poem will bring you there right into the midst of the mystery emotionally and mentally. You'll be right there. So then when you're praying that Our Father and those Hail Marys, hopefully those images that have been called to mind through the poem will still be fresh right there for you. Yeah, I guess my, my question too would be, is it, do you think it's valid, or is it according to the tradition of the rosary, to actually say, I'm, I'm not going to meditate on all the mysteries today, I'm going to say all the glorious mysteries, I want to meditate and say on the resurrection. Um, oh, yes. That's actually one strategy. You know, one way that some saints have prayed the rosary is, let's say if it's the, if, if it's the glorious mysteries that day, they might say, I'm going to pray the entire rosary just immersed in the resurrection or just immersed in the ascension. That's very valid. You know, uh, Christopher mentioned uh, that he's a lay Dominican, and our producer, the irrepressible uh, Sebastian Mafoud, is a lay Dominican, uh, and... Uh, you know, if you want to illustrate the difference between the Dominicans and, say, the Jesuits, uh, one way is to think of uh, the inspiration that led to their founding. Uh, the Dominicans, we remember, were at least in part founded to counter the Albigensian heresy, and the, the Jesuits were in part certainly function this way, founded to combat uh, Protestantism. And now, I'd like to ask you, have you ever run across an Albigensian? <laughs> Not thanks to the mm -hmm. Dominicans. <laughs> right. uh, I, I, I'm a late Dominican, too, actually. Ah, it's kind of a college I was yeah, waiting for you. Oh, you you ever <laughs> run across an Albigensian? <laughs> All right, all, all right, with that, uh, that uh, aside, that, that should be treated strictly as an aside. Uh, you, Annabelle, highlight the tactile quality of the rosary and uh, the Xavier Society, which uh, Skyler is a member, has chosen your book to be translated into Bera. I, I wonder if uh, you and Skyler especially could discuss that whole dimension of your work. Sure, sure. Right. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Skylar. Yeah, so I guess my, my question is, uh, how did you uh, make a connection between the rosary and Braille? Uh, uh, were you, or have you been exposed to Braille or to uh, blind people, or, or was it uh, more of an uh, intellectual connection? And I guess from my perspective, so, so I also am a convert, uh, but, but it's been over 10 years now, and I've been praying the rosary uh, regularly and uh, it, it, you know, with my wife. But I, I have not made a particular connection between the rosary and Braille. And uh, yeah, a, lot, a lot of people try to make connections between different things and Braille. Like, like people will make statues or other materials that they say is in Braille, but, but it's more of the shapes of Braille in, in their mind, whereas I think of Braille as literally just the dot that uh, you know, results in reading material. Uh, but I, I do understand what you meant by the, the uh, idea that you know, there's a connection of touch, that the rosary is, is based on touch. And uh, you know your connection to, to John chapter one was uh, very beautiful. Uh, so yeah, it would be good to hear more about that uh, in your background. And, and I would say, like, if, if there was another edition of 
of the book. It, it would be great to, to uh, maybe add that story uh, to, to build your connection to, to Braille in, in the book. Thank you. That's uh, wonderful. Um, I've long been fascinated by Braille. I think, <laughs> you know, Jesus is the word made flesh. And I'm a poet. I'm a poet. I, I, I love I love words. And to me, you know, Jesus is both the greatest poem and the greatest poet. Uh, the word made flesh. And what I've as a writer, since my childhood I've I've loved Braille. And yes, I've had the prior to this book, prior to my work being transcribed into Braille, I've had what I consider an honor, the honor to feel, you know, <laughs> uh Braille. And just blown away by the, as a writer, as someone who loves words, who loves language, I'm so uh, impressed by, I, I love the life of Louis Braille too, uh, a Catholic. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's from what I can tell, he was a devout Catholic. Yes. And it, it would be interesting to try to open his cause for, for his sainthood. Yes, I agree completely. The fact, I, I just find Braille itself very poetic and beautiful. The fact that without... The, you know, okay, everyone reads, you know, you use your eyes to read. That's the conventional sense of reading. The idea of being able to read and still get those ideas and still have those images in your mind, but be using your hands, hands, the same things that we use to touch to, to, I mean, our hands are so, as you can see in my book, my book has a, the, the image and the metaphor of hands all throughout the importance of touch. We minister through our hands. Hands are essential to the sacraments. Hands are essential to the way we serve. And now to root hands to reading. That, as a poet, I love it. I love it. And so, again, I grew up as a child. I, I read the life of Louis Braille as a child, was fascinated by it. He was a devout Catholic. Um, the very touch, the fact that Jesus is the Word made flesh. So right there in that statement of our belief, it's joining word and what we can touch with our hands, all right? So that's Braille. And the rosary is that same beauty, I feel, um, very, very strongly. Because what's so amazing about the rosary, and God in his wisdom gives this gift through Mary to us, that we're human beings. We need touch. We need touch as human beings. The tactile sense is so important. And the, the rosary is literally, it's this chain to heaven. You know, it's been described that way by the saints. That we can feel we don't need any, any sight. You're in the middle of a dark night. You're afraid for someone that you love. Saints have taught us that just holding the rosary with, dev with devotion is a prayer. It's that act of trust. But, but being able to run your fingers, I mean, the times I've been so privileged to feel Braille and run my fingers along it. And know that, you know, for those who can read it fluently, you're able to get, you're able to get a story from it. Well, when I run my fingers along the beads of the rosary, I get the stories coming alive through touch, through touch. It's more than just prayer, which is wonderful in and of itself, but it's like a touch, a touch, um, a divine touch. And I think that's extremely valuable. Any further thoughts on that, Skyler? There's a lot going on there. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely uh, see the connection. Uh, have you been able to talk to other blind people about this? Uh, either, you know, who might have read the book, or I mean, I, I know that it's it's very newly published. I was just going to say, n not since writing the book, and and I have to say, I feel privileged and blessed to you, you know, to meet you through this. Um, the Xavier Society was excited about the book, so. In other words, the director of the Xavier Society, when he read the book, um, and he's the one that, you know, curates, because, not, you know, only a select number of books are actually, this is why I'm so very honored, um, only a select number of books make it into Braille. Um, he felt that this is something that his, um, you know, the people he serves through the Xavier Society would be excited about. Um, and that was, you know, that was wonderful. Now, our listeners yeah. aren't going to be, for the most part, familiar with the uh, Savior Society. Could could you both tell us a little bit about it? Skylar, would you like to take that? Uh, right. So, so I'm fairly new to it. Uh, so you might, uh, and I only found out about it myself last fall uh, through another 
blind Catholic. Uh, we're, we're in uh, Southern California. But uh, from my understanding, it was founded about 100 years ago uh, in New York City by the Jesuits, or, or at least people who have a, a uh, strong connection to the Jesuits. And uh, they, they publish, uh, for, for a long time, their main activity was uh, publishing books in Braille for the blind. And uh, now they also have an uh, online component as well. And uh, so their catalog has had a pretty diverse set of uh, materials from missiles to uh, uh, you know, lives of the saints, to devotional books. Uh, I, I think uh, some books of the Bible as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, from from uh, I, I've gotten a few books from them in Braille, and uh, of course I, I joined. My membership was approved right before the pandemic, so oh. they were able to get one order in uh, to have Braille books sent through the mail uh, right before that. Uh, now I, I tend to have access to more electronic databases uh, than than many blind people would have, uh, but they are many members, I'm sure, who really rely on Xavier for, for most of their Catholic reading, reading material, whether that's Braille or audio books or an online download of some sort. Uh, and I believe that for people in New York City, they, they uh, have had a lot of uh, community building events as well. And uh, it seems like they, they really improved on their uh, national outreach recently, and uh, it would, would be good to uh, to continue. If, if there is a way that I'm not aware of to meet other blind Catholics through them, uh, that, that would be uh, good to know about as well. I haven't really uh, gotten involved in any of that yet. Anything to add to that, Annabelle? Uh, oh, that's sure. right. Yeah. Well, I know one of the things I'm I'm very um, moved by with the Xavier Society is they have the annual St. Lucy Mass. Um, it's very beautiful, yeah, in the, in in Manhattan and uh, widely attended, you know. And uh, just a, she's such a beautiful saint for all of us. A wonderful patron. She's the patron of the Xavier Society. So um, it's that's beautiful. And I know that that's something I was told by Maliki Fallon, the director, that. Folks come sometimes in from all over the country just to attend that mass, and there is a lot of fellowship, and it's uh, a lovely community in that in that sense. Um, but I just I also love that they that the Xavier Society um, makes available every book that's that's sent out through the Xavier Society. Every work of Braille that they send right. out is made yeah, available funny. completely free, had, uh, and uh, and that's beautiful. So I, I had uh, I've been to New York. My, my parents actually met in New York City, uh, but. We didn't grow up Catholic, so it was only much later that I heard about the Xavier Society. And I guess it's surprising that it didn't come up at all growing up, even though we weren't Catholic. Because yeah, there aren't there aren't a lot of libraries uh, besides the Library of Congress, which makes so many books uh, free to mail out for the blind. Christopher and Maya, anything to say at this point? I, uh, I'm oh, yes. the shift. I, that, but go ahead. I, I have a um, just a comment, and perhaps we can connect with the with a question about the heart. Um, I don't belong to any lay third order, so I'm coming from the pagan world. But I belong to a lay movement, a communion liberation, and my experience has been when I was growing up uh, back in the good old days in Latin America that playing the rosary or any other pious act was uh, generally seen as discipline. And for me, at least, was something that I did not uh, want to do because precisely was based on pure will. And so the claim was that, well, if you do this, then you're going to encounter Christ. In other words, somehow the means become an end. So, to make a long story short, until I just encountered 
uh, Father Yusan, the founder of the uh, Communal Liberation, when he said, when he uh, taught about God as a presence, a presence who attracts us and attracts to our senses, attracts to our heart, move us. Then I began discovering that Christianity is the other way around. In other words, encounter is what made me love him and love his mother. And because I love his mother, I do what his mother may be pleased to see me doing, which is pray the rosary. So for me, the rosary is an attraction. I pray the rosary not because it's a discipline, it's because I love her. And I don't have, don't make any effort in doing that. And I think that, I think that the, that discovery for me was life changing. And so when I go to adoration, I don't go because it's a business. It's because he attracts me and I miss him. So if you say, well, then you have a gift of grace. And so uh, perhaps, uh, probably that is true. But I think the dynamic completely changed. And on the top of that, that is what made me discover the tradition of personalism, particularly from Hildebrand, when he wrote a, a beautiful book that I read in the 80s, which is The Art. You know, that where we are moving ourselves by the heart. And unfortunately, the Thomas tradition, Thomas the tradition was so much ingrained in will. And so when we discovered the heart, well, at least I discovered the heart, that's my experience. The whole way of uh, discipline, if you will, change. And I think that, I think, is, for me at least, is key. So, in that sense, uh, the question that I have for, for you, Annabelle, is what would be then the importance of the heart? And in, not only in the Christian tradition, but um, in praying the rosary. Well, it's a beautiful question, especially since we're in the month of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in here in June as we record this interview. Um, and, you know, I think often of Jesus wanting to turn hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. So the importance of the heart, I think of that wonderful, wonderful line from Scripture that Mary pondered all these things in her heart. And right there in that very line from Scripture, in that very verse, we have the thinking and feeling faculties joined in one. Our, our contemporary society tends to separate uh, thinking and feeling, brain versus heart. Um, have you thought this through versus what are you feeling? And one of the fascinating things about scripture is discovering that the word heart is used, oh, just many, many hundreds of times in scripture. You don't see brain. You don't see brain in scripture. You see heart. And scripture joins, you know, it's, that's why, you know, God's example is so uh, unifying for us. It's, it brings all things together and makes it into one beautiful, it, it's not separate, it's not divided. The, the, so for, for Mary to ponder in her heart, she's using her very heart to work things through. And that says it all. That's what the rosary does. It's not, you know, it's not the kind of thing some people might say, oh, that's just for people who are, you know, touchy-feely and that's not me. Or someone else would say, well, that's just for someone who's, you know, very, uh, oh, just trying to think about everything. Well, it's it's everything. It's it's pondering in our hearts. That's what the rosary does. Um, you know, that's what I think is, is the key. We ponder in our hearts. When we pray the rosary... Uh, I, I always think of that beautiful part of the Hail Holy Queen. And then after, at the very end of the rosary, um, we pray, may we imitate what the mysteries contain and obtain what they promise. How do we obtain what they promise? How do we imitate what the mysteries contain? It's only by engaging our heart. That wonderful motto of St. John Henry Newman, cor ad cor loquitor, is heart speaks to heart. Now, we know that the one of the main devotions of the Catholic Church is that they call it the twin hearts or the two hearts, and it's the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary, the, the two of those hearts talking to each other. But it's also our heart joined to the heart of Our Lady and through her, her son, in the rosary. Christopher, do you want to add, uh, clarify, develop? Yeah, um... <clears throat> I, uh, first of all, I want to say I, I, I've read um, 
to, uh, the teacher from Philip Brown's um, The Heart. I think it's a very interesting book. Very, I think it has some insights which are very important. Uh, I guess my only question would be is that uh, when it comes to uh, desire and feelings, an effective aspect, those things are not always present. Sometimes, in many things in life, what we do is we do what we do because of a, a sense of duty. And sometimes it, it seems to, to return to that whole idea of the rosary as discipline. Uh, sometimes you just don't feel like praying the rosary. You don't feel like going to Mass or, you, you know, maybe going through a dry part, or a dry part of, one of your life or, or what we call a dark night of the soul where there is no consolation. So isn't it right to say that in a certain sense we have to maintain that discipline even when the effective aspects of our, of our being are not responsible? Absolutely. And one of the best things about our Catholic faith is our faith is a both and kind of faith. Now, this is something I talk about in my in my classroom, you know, both and. So uh, meaning, you know, Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. <laughs> so we have that all across the board in our faith. There's always the both and. So yes, we pray the rosary out of our love and yes, we pray the rosary or we pray anything. We, we go through our day doing what we're supposed to because we ought to. It's both. Um, the, the, but the main thing, though, is if we look at ourselves, if we look at our motivations, if we think of the days, if we just compare it to, let's just say, our, our practical daily duties in life. If we look at, for example, when you have a small, a, a baby in the house, a small child, and you've gone through sleepless nights, the baby's adorable, it's your child, you love, you love the baby unbelievably, but sometimes you haven't had sleep for three days in a row, and you just don't want to get out of bed, but the baby is crying, so you do it, and you do it out of that sense of duty and discipline, and this must be done. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, if we dig it at the why of the duty, it always comes back to love. Even if it doesn't feel warm and fuzzy at the time, our duty is always rooted to our love. And sometimes love is, is uh, simply an expression of the will. Because... Love is an expression of the will. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yes, and when our, our will, being our will, we can choose what to do with it. And when we put it in the right place, that's an act of love. Don't do One more thing, if I may. Yes, there have things. I want to ask if you've heard this. Have you, are you familiar with the <laughs> sonatas of Heinrich Ignaz Franz Bieber? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yes, I, I am as well, the Rosary Sonata. Right. And right. there's a sonata for each mystery of the Rosary. Right. Very odd work because he changes, in some of them he changes to the tuning of the violin for symbolic things. So if people haven't heard of Bieber, B-I-B-E-R, not, uh, not that other Bieber, not Justin Bieber, but... <laughs> this is so funny. My husband just made a joke about that yesterday. I was playing Bieber yesterday, actually, the mystery sonatas, right? Is that? And my husband comes in, and he goes, oh, I guess uh, forebear of the great Justin Bieber. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but Heinrich Bieber. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Justin. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to... Uh develop this some more, and uh, von Hildebrand certainly is a, a major source for a discussion of, of the central role of the heart, and Newman's whole life certainly uh, calls us to reflect on the heart, and every once in a while in this show, we just do a little philosophical sprint, and <laughs> This was uh, partly because of Sebastian Maffoud, who in his introduction to the show uh, promises that the uh, listeners, the gentle listeners, will hear the, as he puts it, the dulcet tones of Catholic <laughs> wisdom. And sometimes we, we uh, 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 talk about how what's on the program is involved with all that dulcet. But we're, we're certainly aiming for Catholic wisdom. And I think one of the, the great Catholic thinkers of our time is Robert Spemann. And he died just uh, maybe, maybe a year ago. And in one of his books, titled Persons, 
subtitle, The Difference Between Someone and Something. He has a, a, a short discussion of the heart. He discusses it in various places, but it's in his presentation on the soul that uh, he discusses the heart uh, insofar as I want to cite him directly. And what I want to do is read a paragraph. Uh, so this is Robert Schumann. He says, uh, under the Christian influence, human life must be divinized. Two considerations led in this direction both connected with the discovery of the person and the concept of the heart that was decisive for it. So concept of the heart was decisive for the discovery of the person. He continues, by definition, spirit is the power and presence of truth, participation in the divine. The egocentrically driven tendency opposing spirit is called in the language of the New Testament, flesh. The sight of decision between spirit and flesh is the heart. There it is resolved whether spirit will remain opposed to flesh or become the defining reality of human existence. The act of the heart that opens itself to the light is called love. The act of the heart that opens itself to the light is called love. The first command of Christianity as of Judaism is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. The whole heart, mind, and strength naturally mean a conversion of experience, feeling, and will. The heart is what makes the human soul spiritual. Love is the distinctive aspect of the personal soul. Uh, I, I think Spiman, uh, in that passage, connects with a lot of the, the points that uh, that you all have been making. And I guess the, the litany of the sacred heart, which uh, my wife and I pray, to so see and reduce it to me, that there's several... Uh, points in there, which like the abode of justice and love, and uh, other uh, points in there to describe the fire of God's love in, in some way. It's very, a very powerful way. So the litany of the Sacred Heart, yes. Right. There's a um, uh, actually an encyclical by Pius the Twelfth. Uh, on the Sacred Heart, and there's a litany developed from, uh, a different sort of litany developed from that very encyclical, and it's featured in this month's Magnificat. And I think a number of our listeners probably will have heard of the Magnificat. You know, I, I'd love to add, I'd love to add one quick thing, which is just, that was very beautiful, and, and thank you for sharing that. I think that's Perfect, and especially for the month we're in, this June, this month of the Sacred Heart. Um, just that I teach a course to my graduate students on Lexio Divina, and you know, we're taught, we're taught in Lexio Divina. This is the actual quote that comes, and of course, that's an ancient Benedictine tradition, right? It goes back to to very ancient monasteries, and that Lexio Divina is a way of it's called, you know, it means divine reading or sacred reading. Um, when we do Lexio Divina, we're taught by St. Benedict to listen, and this is the exact quote, to listen with the ear of your heart. And I always, I love, I love that quote, to listen with the ear of your heart. That Lexio Divina, when we do it right, and this is a daily practice for Benedictines, but, but really it's for all Catholics, we're advised to read scripture every day. Lexio Divina means we're, we're reading sacredly. We're reading in a divine way where we read it more than once. And we, we, we kind of, we, we chew on it. You know, one of the, I love the image that they give, St. Benedict gives of um, uh, chewing it like, uh, like an animal would chew its cud, that you, you chew over scripture, the same line again and again and again. And we, we wait for it to process where the 
ear of our heart can hear it. And if we do this with scripture, as scripture and the rosary, which is an outgrowth of scripture, it's Mary's Psalter, we become in the practice of listening with the ear of our heart, not just in our prayer, but in how we serve and how we go out there in the world and serve. We're in a time right now where I think everyone would agree that in the world, everyone's lost. In many cases, many are lost in their own agenda, not even being honest with themselves and with others, just whatever their agenda is, is all they want to push and not listen. And if we listen with the ear of our heart, that's where we can meet others in love and grow together. So that's where our prayer, if we go into that place in the heart and listen with the ear of the heart, we can do that in our lives. And uh, I get to bring it back to the, to connect with the book for, for us blind people who can read Braille, we're able to view much here to be in a, in a different way. Where it's, Usually without Braille, we're either having things read to us by people or by the, the voice of the computer. And so it's hard to be as reflective and, uh, when reading uh, in, in, in those ways. Uh, and, and especially when uh, a person is reading to us, it's harder for us to stop and go back to something as easily as we can in, in uh, Braille. Uh, let's just... Uh understand what's going on with Braille better than we would otherwise have thought. Very helpful. I, I think we should begin now to focus on poetry. And in focusing on poetry, I, I want to begin with something technical. Uh, Annabelle, you've developed something called the Mirror Sonnet, the Mirror Sonnet. Could you tell us about that? Certainly. It's a new poetic form I invented. Um, it takes a conventional sonnet, a Shakespearean sonnet, which, um, of course, is written in iambic pentameter, which is a certain rhythm that's very pleasing to the ear. That's why we love Shakespeare. Um, one of the many reasons we love Shakespeare, because it's so melodic. Um, and then takes that sonnet, right? And if we remember back to learning about sonnets in school, it has that rhyme scheme, that A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, and of course where every letter that matches is a rhyme. Well, I take that sonnet, and then the second sonnet right below that original sonnet that I write is a mirror image of the first sonnet. So the last line of, the, of that sonnet A, or the first sonnet, becomes the first line of the second sonnet. So I have to write it in such a way that it makes sense when it's when it's read backwards and not only makes sense, but hopefully offers a new insight. Um, the reason I invented this new poetic form was I wanted the whole point of it was to have the form reflect the meaning. Um, a, you know, a poem in a way you have, you have the rhythm and the str and the, the rhythm and the rhyme is like the body of the poem, you know, and then the soul within or the, or the, or the feelings within is, is the meaning of the poem. So it's like a body in that way, really. You're building a poem and then you're putting soul into it. So I wanted the form or the body of that poem to reflect a greater theological reality, which is that through the rosary, much like through prayer, much like through any wisdom attained in life, with time, with time, with reflection, you can look at the exact same thing that happened and gain new insight. So I wanted a poetic form uh, for these ideas that would literally show, wow, you know, th th when you look back on something, like when you look back on those words, when you look back on your life, when you pray again and again, you can pray the same prayer, you can pray the same mystery of the rosary. And the insight you got two years ago on the wedding feast at Cana, you know, Today, you gain a whole new insight. You say, I can't believe I never thought of that before. That's incredible. Well, I wanted a poem to reflect that. Also, these mirror sonnets have repetition, right? So I created a form that would sort of show and remind us what the rosary does. So, you know, for example, one of my first poems in the book um, is a mirror sonnet. And the first line, I'm sorry, the first poem ends with the line, um, you know, for sifting death from those who long to live. And then the next poem begins for sifting death from those who long to live. So 
you get in, in the beginning, actually the first poem, the first line of the first poem is a mother knows her son's hands like her own. And then the last line of the second poem is once again, a mother knows her son's hands like her own. But the idea is that even though there's the repetition, there's new insight with the way it's seen in the mirror image. So when we pray the rosary, all that repetition, we know that, yeah, sure, it's, it's an exor- it has to be an exercise because it's developing the muscles of our heart. It has to be. By definition, it is. But it's more than that. It's also, it's both and. It's discipline, but it's also an act of love, a, a willful act of love. And it's cultivating that the more we do it, even though we're repeating the same words, we're gaining new insights. So that's the mirror sonnet. And that's uh, that new poetic form is in Sacred Braille, published by En Route Books and Media. Isn't there something of uh, the same thing in the Hebrew poetry of the Psalms? You bet. There's an element of repetition there that's very much by design. Yes. Okay, so... What you're doing, what you're doing, has a scriptural antecedent as well. Yes, and it, you know, it's funny because it does two things simultaneously. That repetition makes for good poetry. You know, um, tree at my window, window tree. That's a famous poem. You repeat. Everyone knows, even little children know, and and we're all, you know, even what's good for little children is usually good for the for the formed adult. Um, repetition is beautiful when done right. So there's that music to it. We know this in music. We know this in songs. There's the refrain. The Psalms have that poetic musicality. It just works. And the ear falls in love with it. And then the ear of the heart falls in love with it. But it also, because the Psalms are also simultaneously prayer, repetition helps train us in our prayer. So it it kind of has both the form um, and the function. I'd like to... uh, uh call our attention to one of your shorter poems and it's not a mirror sonnet but it's very appealing to me it's uh, on page 49 of your text and the title is Mary Recalls the Presentation and it begins with uh, uh, Simeon the venerable old man. I can I can relate to, to venerable old man not because I'm venerable <laughs> but because I'm old. But <laughs> uh, well, I've been 39 for decades. <laughs> uh, so I, I I'd like to uh, read. Uh, the last, or I guess it'd be maybe the last third of the poem. As that man spoke, and that's Simeon, as that man spoke, I knew this day was his as much as ours. As our amazement rose, his hope awoke, prepared him for his death, due in mere hours. He kissed my hand, and then he bowed, withdrew. That night I dreamed a curtain tore in two. I think that's a a very evocative passage. What do you like about it? Well, a number of things. Uh, First of all, the curtain tore in two. And that echoes happen, that echoes, reflects, connects with what happens with the crucifixion in the temple. May I? Yes, please. So when I hear and I read his poem, uh, that moved my heart. And that led me to the idea, I think, probably we need another program, about what uh, Pope Francis called contemporary Pelagianism, which you read in his exhortation, Be Glad and Rejoice which is a, a way of understanding which comes from in the memorial time, but still is alive, that see piety as an expression of either will or intellect. And he expressed that clearly in one of the, the paragraphs. 
And he says, ultimately, what moves us is the heart. And the heart is not something that moves out of duty, it's out of love. Now, what is the role of poetry and beauty in that? It's actually the attraction. So, and this is very uh, noticeable when you start talking about people who don't believe in anything, nihilism. They are attracted by, by love. Otherwise, we are going to make doing something or discipline equal to all religious faith. And Christ is a presence. A presence that attracts us because it's an exceptional presence. And move our senses. But how there is a very fine line there that we need to explore, if you will. And so, which I think ultimately lies into an anthropology, which is an internal anthropology. You see, to what extent really we understand that the human heart is also part of the human experience. But I think it's, it's, it's <laughs> we need another program for that. Well, we have lots of programs, so we can sure do that. We are getting kind of close to our our time allotment here, and I sure wish that Annabelle would would read one of her poems. Oh, I'd be happy to. All right, thank you. This is The Crucifixion Through the Eyes of the Good Thief. It was the only good thing I had known in all my life, to die beside my God. Before now, hate was all that I'd been shown. I was a sinner, stealer, and a fraud. My arms were forced apart, splayed out in fear. His arms opened in love, willing embrace. I wished that I could bend and bow, revere his feet, then wipe the blood from his good face. Instead, I called across the space between his cross and mine, and that was oceans wide. For he was innocence, his heart was clean, and knew how I had hated, envied, lied. And yet he promised me today, today, the world had told me leave, God told me stay. Thank you very much. We're going to end with the gospel uh, for the day. Uh, and it's uh, from Mark. And uh, sometimes the gospel for the day connects in a pretty obvious way with what we've been talking about. I, I don't see that with today's gospel, but I I do see in today's gospel uh, a direct connection with people who question and a direct connection with hard cases, sorts of cases that some philosophers delight in. And I do see a connection with uh, transcendence, that the kingdom to come uh, is... Uh, something that's unlike what we've directly experienced, but uh, begins with what we've directly experienced. So the gospel for today. Some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and put this question to him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, if someone's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first married a woman and died, leaving no descendants. So the second brother married her and died, leaving no descendants. And the third likewise, and the seven left no descendants. Last of all, the woman also died. At the resurrection, when they arise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had been married to her. And Jesus said to them, are you not misled because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? 
Lambda arrives from the dead. They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they're like the angels in heaven. Now, as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God told him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly misled. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you, Annabelle. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Christopher. And Mario suggested another show. And, and Annabelle, we have something uh, here for you to sign right now saying that you will be guest on this other show. <laughs> well, it was a joy <laughs> to talk to all of you. An electronic signature, so wait for it to pop up. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.